when you're 50 plus, there are no shoulds. There's nobody telling you, well, you should know what you want to be when you grow up because we're already there. So figuring out what your goals are is, is one of the first golden rules, as I, as I call it. Talking with people about how to have a great retirement. This is the Rock Your Retirement Show. We don't talk about money, but we talk about almost everything else you need to rock your retirement. Now, here's your host, Kathy Klein. Hi, this is Kathy from Rock Your Retirement. I am so excited because today I have Bart Astor on the show, and he has written a book called AARP Roadmap for the Rest of Your Life. And this book, it does talk about money. But it also talks about health, work, lifestyle, and pursuing your dreams. And that's what this show is about. So, Bart, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm so glad that you're here. And, you know, I didn't say this on your intro, but you've been on some very famous shows such as Good Morning America. You've been on The Marketplace through PBS. You've been on Rick Edelman's The Truth About Money Two Boomer Babes and Boomers Rock Radio, um, among the massive amounts of writing that you do. So I am honored that you're on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about this book. Now, it's not the only book you wrote, but this is this book, it's on the best selling list, right? Well, it was, yes. I'm very proud of this book. I've written 14 total, but this is really, this is my favorite book. It was really a labor of love. I was very fortunate. I've been working with Wiley for a long time, and they created a new program with AARP, and they just, this fit perfectly the profile for the kind of books that AARP was doing. So they came out with this, with with the AARP name on the cover. Needless to say, that's a wonderful benefit for any author to have an organization like AARP sponsor this. And what we've found is people... We trust AARP, and they trust the kind of information that they put out. So, yes, I was very proud that it did hit the Washington Post bestseller list. It was on. Um, it was number one on Amazon's retirement category for six weeks. Awesome. Which was one. It was wonderful. I mean, I have to say, my ego was really stroked on that. I, <laughs> I admit, uh, we all have egos, and and that's. It really was a pat on the back, and I, but but it was mostly because I really felt good about it. And and the comments that I got from the from the readers were very positive that thank you. It's it's the kind of thing that is helpful to people. And I really appreciated that. That's great. So a couple of things. One is, I love how you said that your ego was stroked, because one of my pet peeves is when when somebody says, I was really humbled by that. And I'm like, no, you weren't. <laughs> That's the opposite of humbled. <laughs> no, you know, what's interesting, I just wrote an interesting article about when to call it quits. It's on Next Avenue. And actually, this is an article that was picked up by Money Magazine, it was picked up by Money Watch, it was picked up by Forbes. Uh, and, and what I talked about is the idea of when we are working and thinking about retirement, one of the issues we have to deal with is our ego, our identity. Who are we? And I made it really clear that, you know, I'm only ready to call it quits when I no longer have to say, oh, I'm a writer. I, I, you know, it's, there is some satisfaction to say, this is who I am. I am defined as being a writer. I could have been a doctor, a lawyer, or, or whatever. And I, but I do recognize that it is a lot of ego. It's who I am. It's part of my identity. So, in fact, I admit I have an ego. We all <laughs> do. And I'm very proud of the fact that one of the things that I've done in my life has been successful. Well, I love it. And how can you be successful if you have zero ego? <laughs> yes, that's true. I mean, really. I mean, all of us who have some level of success have some level of ego. I'm sorry. I, I'm i not going to talk about the current president, but even the past no, no. president has some ego or he wouldn't be president, right? Uh, uh, yes, you have. it's a drive. There's sort of a <laughs> drive to, for that. And the, the kind of person who would choose to be uh, whether it's president or a CEO or just a successful writer or a successful artist or, frankly, even a successful um, salesperson or janitor, plumber. I mean, there has to be some pride in your work. And that is your identity. That is your ego. And this is the kind of thing that I have found th- throughout my life. I've, I've had a, a very varied career. 
I've, I've been in many, many different kinds of careers, not just different jobs. I, I've been on no fewer than seven, eight, nine different careers. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. But it's fun. Um, one could say, you know, I can't hold a job, but one could also <laughs> say that it's, it, I do get, I admit, I do get a little bored with certain things. And after three, four, five years, I've kind of, you know, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, ate the sweatshirt, you know, um, that kind of stuff. And um, I need to move on and find something new and challenging. Fortunately for me, one of the key elements of almost every job I've had has been writing and communicating. Oh, so you were writing the whole time? In every possible job. And if you think about it, every job has, unless you're a tradesperson or something like that, every job is going to have some sort of writing, whether it's memos or uh, you're speaking to a group of people or at a meeting or something. But there's almost always some writing element. And the more that you, the better that you are at it, the more you're likely to succeed in that particular job and that particular career. And I found that in all of the jobs that that I've had, I gravitated toward those tasks more easily than some of the other tasks that are inherent in the other jobs. I'll give you one 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 story. I um, I shared an office. I was the okay. I was in student financial aid for many many years. And I had a job as the fiscal director of financial aid at City University of New York. And my office mate had an, all, an equally responsible job. And he, would, he had lots of memos to write. And he'd sit at the computer and he'd just try to crunch it out. And he'd labor and labor and labor. And he had such a difficult time doing that. And we, I had to same kind of thing. I had to put out lots of memos to people and I, I would just get in there and crunch it right out and it would come out. And he was so envious of that because he knew that that held me, it held him back in the kind of opportunities that he had to move on in the organization. Well, you know, what's funny is that I am, um, you know, I listen to different business coaches. I, I like to listen to podcasts. And one of the things that I've discovered over the years is that methodology is not to work on things that you're not good at. It's to really hone in the skills that you're good at, and then you can become great at something. But if you try to work on your not so good qualities at work, you'll never be great. You'll just be mediocre. And so I love the fact that you're writing. I'm sorry for your office mate, but I bet that if he had honed in on something that he was really good at, he could be great. Oh, he was very good at what he did. Unfortunately, I think that that limited his ability to demonstrate how good he was in the kinds of things where he was, I would say, great, but but certainly quite good at. Um, I, I may differ with you a little bit. I, I do think we have to work a little bit more on our weaknesses. Otherwise, I think we're being siloed. Um, and, and so to me, I would love to see more people in particular, I'd like to see more people learn how to write well. So it'd be like Einstein learning how to do his hair. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, well, point well taken there, Kathy. Um, hmm. well, like, yes, but that his that was his brand. Talk about the uh, current brand. Um, <laughs> Einstein's brand was his hair. Um, certainly he would not have made it just if he was just some, you know, slick looking guy, like every other engineer in the, in the thirties and forties and twenties. And, um, but so he, he had a outspoken way about him and, and yes, you're probably right. Maybe, but actually maybe he did work on his hair. Maybe we don't know. Cause we can't ask him now. Can we? <laughs> yeah, maybe that was his genius. He was really a genius in marketing. Oh yeah. Now, I wanted to bring up the fact that you actually founded the college planning quarterly. Is that correct? Yes. And so did you start that because you realized how good you were at writing when you were doing that job? That's interesting. No, I, I, um, I saw a need, uh, back in the nineties before everything was online, there was, there were books coming out routinely, of course, and about how to pay for college and how to get into college and everything about, um, higher education, whether it was applying for aid or applying for admission, but that was, that was that area. And I saw that the guidance counselors at the high schools were really hurting for 
latest information, and not just information, but solutions, they all felt that they just didn't know enough. So a newsletter was a great way to let people know about that in a, in a really timely way. So in, in certain times of the year when they're dealing with admission and students are coming in and saying, okay, what schools should I apply to? Well, there are questions that they always want to know about how do I maximize my application um, so that I can get accepted. Though, and, and other times a year it might be about, well, how do I apply for financial aid? So what you want, I wanted to do is present a very simple format and in an eight-page newsletter, quarterly, which probably should have been monthly, but uh, on a quarterly basis, to tell them what they needed to know then, because I knew that these guidance counselors are not going to remember any of this stuff three months from now. So, But when they needed it now, they had it. And if they wanted to, they could make copies and they could just give it out to the kids of that particular article. That's I great. I, I didn't care. Yeah, I love that. I owned it or not. It was about getting the word out. And it was it was fairly successful for a while. And then material became so available online and that it would just it it died a, a natural death. Okay. Well let's circle back to retirement and how people can have a good retirement. So this book has been out for a couple years. And in your writings, you have something called the five rules, five golden rules. What what is that? Yeah, I, you know, the, whenever you, you appear on shows and people want lists, they love lists. I love lists. Of course we all do. You know, <laughs> we, you like bullets, you like lists. So we all, you'll see a page and the first thing you do is go to a bullet or a list. Um, so I came up with the things that, I, the five things that I think are particularly important as we got older. And the first one is at, 50 plus, and I'll be generic and just say 50 plus, but of course it could be 60, 70. It could even be 40 plus, but probably not. It's more like 50, 60 plus. The first one is you get to choose your goals. Um, You get to choose your own shoulds based on the question of what are your goals for this stage in life. You know, we, throughout our lives, we've had role models. Uh, you know, I wanted, when I was, I was going to be a, a cowboy, I was going to be a fireman. I was going to be, actually, I wanted to be shortstop for the New York Yankees, but mm, not so much. <laughs> I thought you wanted to be seven or eight different things because those were your careers that you had. <laughs> oh, that was that week. Uh, but, but, you know, you know what I mean? So every, so all through our lives, we have these goals, you know, it's like, I'm, what am I going to major in? Uh, what am I going to be when I grow up? Uh, who I'm going, going to marry? Do I want a family? And at some point in your life, you may not have goals anymore. And if, if you stop someone on the street who's, you know, 60, 70 years old, you might ask them, well, do you have any goals? And they would have a difficult time saying, well, no, I probably don't. And they'd have to think about it. Maybe they would figure out something. And in fact, what's interesting, the, the whole purpose of this book or the, or the start of Roadmap book was because um, I was talking with uh, Gail Sheehy, who wrote passages way back in the 70s, I think, um, seminal work, passages and also passages in caregiving. And Gail and I were at this ARP meeting. She was talking about her husband, Clay, who was quite ill at the time and undergoing palliative care. And the palliative care doctor came to see them and asked Clay, who was quite ill, of course, what are your goals for this stage in life? And he answered something. I actually, frankly, don't remember what the answer he gave. But it occurred to me that I don't think I have any goals for this stage in life. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. So, so when you're 50 plus, there are no shoulds. There's nobody telling you, well, you should know what you want to be when you grow up because we're already there. So figuring out what your goals are is is one of the first golden rules, as I call it. Okay, that was a long way of of getting to that first one. That's okay, because we are going to come back after this break, and we are going to get the other four golden rules. We are here with Bart Astor, the author of AARP Roadmap for the Rest of Your Life, and we will be right back after this break. Remember all those projects you put off because you were too busy? Now you have the time 
but why aren't they getting done? Hi, my name is Lisa Woodruff, and I'm a professional organizer and productivity expert. So why are those projects that you put off until you had the time not getting done while you rock your retirement? Well, just because you have the time doesn't mean you'll actually do the projects. So here are three tips. Number one, give yourself permission to let the project go. Maybe you don't really want it done anyway. Or number two, can you do it with a friend? Is there someone else that also wants to get a similar project done in their life or in their home, and you could both be accountability partners to each other? Or finally, number three, give yourself a schedule and a deadline. Let's just get it done. Each year, pick one project that you are putting off until retirement and get it done. Give yourself an hour a day on your calendar and set the goal to be done by December 1st. You can do this. Check out the Organize 365 podcast for more on how to get organized as you rock your retirement. Welcome back to Rock Your Retirement. We're here with Bart Astor, who is the author of the best-selling book, AARP Roadmap for the Rest of Your Life. And he's giving us the five golden rules for setting the roadmap to your second adulthood. So Bart, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and, and to continue on my five golden rules. To, re- to repeat, the first one was um, you get to choose your goals at, when you're 50 plus. The second one is that most of what happens to us in our lives is not really a surprise. I mean, yes, sometimes life will bring the unexpected, you know, illness, injury, or if you're really lucky, the lottery winnings. But more often than not, we can see the ball coming right at us right off the bat. And in order to to be successful as a ball player or as doing anything, you kind of have to anticipate and think about what you want to do with the ball when it's hit to you. So before it's hit to you, you have to think about what you're going to do with it. By anticipating and planning and budgeting and paying attention, we don't have to, to rely on luck to reach our goals later on. That is, if we think ahead, we can just, we know what we're going to do when we get there. We know the kids are going to eventually leave the nest, of course. We know that we're going to get older. We know that we're, our bodies are going to fail us in some way. What? Well, what do you yes. mean? Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. They are going to. No, um, no. Yeah, don't well, tell me welcome that. Welcome to the world. But it doesn't mean <laughs> that it doesn't mean that we can't do things. It means we have to do it differently. So instead of diving for the ball at third base, I'm going to wait for the ball to come to me, or I'm going to say to the shortstop, "It's your ball." <laughs> Smart. <laughs> so the, the next goal is your level of activity influences your choices. Now, what I mean by the level of activity is partly has to do with health. And partly has to do with age, but it also has to do with our personalities. Um, if you are a type A kind of person, well, guess what? You're always going to be a type A person. You don't. The tiger does not change his stripes, and it's very unlikely that you will either. So um, you have to know that when you decide, oh, I'm going to move somewhere, and you decide, well, I want to live on the beach somewhere and just, you know, eat bonbons and be by, be by the beach. But if you've been a type A person, that's not always going to work out very well. In fact, I have a story about uh, some very good friends of mine who did that, in fact, that same thing, actually. They moved to a beach community after working, owning their business where they worked six, seven days a week, at long hours. And they moved to the beach community. And for the first six months or a year, they were really busy building their house and getting to know things. And after about the first year, they said, okay, now what? (laughs) Exactly. We we loved visiting here. You know, oh, they come every year for a week or two, and it was a great vacation. Now they live here, and that was a different thing. So they started searching around for different things to do when, oh, Andrea became a um, a painter and uh, a firefighter. She joined the volunteer fire department. Uh, John became a realtor, um, and they still – it just wasn't enough. It, and, and then they didn't know what they were going to do, and all of a sudden, one of the few restaurants on, on the island came open for sale. So they bought it. And they they were in seventh heaven. They're back working six, seven days a week and loving it. And now 
as the, they've now owned it for four or five years, they've now gotten to the idea of, okay, now I understand to slow down, I can do it gradually. But to go from you know, full-time to zero, zero was not going to work for them. So your, your level of activity, who you are, your personality should influence the kinds of choices that you make when you are retiring. Another point I want to make is that the quality of life, and that's all we talk about, is the quality of life. Yeah, because that's what this show is about, retirement lifestyle. Isn't that? Yes, thank you. I, I totally agree. I mean, it's about our lifestyle, what we want to do. And all of these, these planners talk a lot about budgeting, and I, they look at it like a diet. And I'm sorry, budgeting is good budgeting is not a diet. It's not to get you to live within your means. Um, it's about figuring out how you can maintain the lifestyle that you're most comfortable with for the rest of your life and playing off different choices. So my wife, for example, is a gym rat. Well, let's say, I mean, gym dues could be very expensive, but she's a gym rat. And for her to give up the gym is crazy. I mean, that would just destroy her lifestyle. Whereas me, I gladly give up the gym. I'm not a problem. <laughs> you and I are on the same page, I think. I'm sorry. You know, I, I like going. It's fun once in a while, but eh, not so much. You know, I like, I like to look at the, at the, but the body's working out, the, 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 the buff, people as well as the not so buff people. It's just fun. But other than that, it's really not a lot of fun for me, but she is. And so part of the necessities in our life is to make sure that we have a gym membership for her. It's, it's typically a discretionary expenditure, but not in our lives. So I think that's the kind of thing when you, you choose your lifestyle, you choose your budget, you don't think of it as a diet, but rather as a guide to the kinds of priorities that you have in your life. That's excellent. Th thank you. The last thing I will say about these, these key talking points is don't judge yourself. You know, you've made your decisions. This is who you are. Accept who you are. You're 50, 60, 70 years old. You know, this is who you are. Don't say, oh, I wasted my life. Don't regret it does you no good. My sister-in-law was a, a middle school principal. And, you know, that's a crazy life. It's a very stressful life. And she was looking forward to her retirement. And the, the whole family was concerned that when she retired, she was going to sit around and do nothing and eat bonbons and watch um, Nick at Night or some silly soap opera kind of thing. And I said, so, so what? Yeah, um, if that's what she wants to do, let her do it. Exactly. And it's not permanent. That's so right. Guess what she, so, so for the first few weeks, guess what she did? Well, she didn't eat the bonbons, but, but she, <laughs> did, she, she did. She sat around eat, doing crossword puzzles, watching ridiculous TV and doing nothing. And then gradually started saying, okay, I'm tired of this. I now want to go out and um, have lunch with a friend or I wanted this or I wanted that. And now she is busy volunteering her time. She's busy with her grandkids. Um, she's doing things, but she didn't have to judge yourself and say, oh, it's a terrible thing to do nothing. So many people that I speak with say, I can't retire. I have no, I have no hobbies. Well, of course you do have hobbies. You have things that you like to do, whether it's watching TV, it's watching old movies. It doesn't matter. You have something that occupies your time when you're not at work. Okay. So I have a question for you. Yeah. I have a guilty pleasure. I watch Sister Wives. Is that, should I not judge myself for that? <laughs> You're getting a lot of pleasure out of that judgment, aren't you? I am. I am. We, Don't tell me what happens because I'm, we, I'm, I'm binge I watching. I've watched American Idol for years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, although I will admit, I, I will admit, I did watch, we did, oh, and I watched Dancing with the Stars. Oh, you know? okay. I mean, look, this, it, it's so much fun to watch somebody go from being reasonably talented to marvelous. Um, and I always root for people who are, have some talent and then just blossom. You know what I call dancing with stars? I call okay. it dancing with the dancers. Cause the people who always win are always, they always have some background. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so amazing to be able to spend eight weeks with these incredible dancers? Oh yes, it would. It would. Ah. 
Now, what was, by the way, that one of my careers was, was in show business. I can tell. Absolutely. And, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. No, okay. it's good. It's a good thing. I, I, and I was an actor. I was not a very good actor, <laughs> but I, I had a very good voice. So I had a good voice and I was, I took lots of dance lessons and I was a decent dancer. Um, I just was not a very good actor. So in this competitive environment, there was no way I was going to be able to be, uh, to, to do, to be successful unless you can, you're a triple threat. You're really not going to make it. And plus I didn't have this ridiculous drive that so many people have and, and they're the ones who make it because they are driven. But, um, I just, I, I just love dance and I love to, I love to be able to be with these professionals. I've been thinking recently, this is literally very recently. I'm talking about yesterday. Mm. I was sitting uh, on the beach, thankfully, and I'm talking to my wife and I'm reading a John Irving book, who is one of my favorite authors. And I, I thought, you know what might be fun at this stage in my life to take a creative writing course. I thought it's scary I mean, I've been a writer for 40 years, right? And now I'm going to get judged by my writing, by all of these people in a class or by this teacher. Um, but I'm thinking I might want to do that just because it would be challenging and fun and interesting. You know what would be fun? If you didn't tell anyone you were actually a writer. <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, that'd be an interesting thing. I don't know what will happen. If I do take this class, it'll be in you know, some lo local community college kind of thing or or a um, evening program somewhere and see what that's like well Maybe don't would... tell because the you would make the instructor so nervous if i was the instructor and somebody came in and said yeah i'm a writer and then i googled them and found out they were a best-selling writer i would be mortified i would totally i would freak out so i oh, see and i would go the other way i'd say yeah let me look at this stuff that's yeah, not so good <laughs> Well, the person teaching the community college course probably isn't a best-selling author. I mean, maybe they are, but it would be really intimidating. So don't tell them. That's a good point. No, I wouldn't do it. And also, <laughs> I don't want to set expectations for myself either. And the fact is, to be very honest, the kind of writing that I've done throughout my life has is so different. Well, it's nonfiction. It's great. Everything I've done is nonfiction. Fiction is a total different world. And... Um, despite the fact that I have, you know, been written all these books, I could not get a book contract for a, a book of fiction. I mean, that's the way the publishing industry works. Even though I do have successful books, it's not fiction. And so I'm only as good as the, the words that were written on the page. Well, so have a blast in this creative writing. And who knows? I have a friend who was a writer for the Wall Street Journal. And she went off and got her MFA and she's working on novels now and she's just having the time of her life. So good for her. Yeah. So I hope you I hope you enjoy your creative writing class and you write a story and tell me about it. You know, when you get it, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put a little link to it. That'll be fun. Yeah. So, you know, I can't believe it. This time is flying by and we're coming up to the end of our interview. And I do know that you wanted to tell the listeners about a freebie that you have to, that we're giving away. So do you want to talk about that? Uh, I mentioned earlier the idea of the level of activity. When I was writing the book, I put together a scale to talk about the kinds of things and, and sort of defining you know, the, the eight or ten levels so that you can put yourself in this kind of activity scale and make determinations there. So that's the kind of – it's a, it's a scale essentially and where you – are on this may help guide you about the decisions you kind of make. Now, I do want to say one thing. You're not locked into this scale. Um, I have a very good friend who is in a wheelchair now, and when he, but before he was in a wheelchair, he was totally immobile. He had a very difficult time being getting anywhere because he was using crutches and he was in pain. Hmm. And he got into a wheelchair, and he is so much more mobile now that – he actually increased his level of activity by getting into the wheelchair. So wow. you're not locked into being there, but it gives you an idea of where you are in this, level, this activity. So you can make determinations about what you want in your later years. So I give that away as, as a sort of a, a, an opportunity. That makes so much sense. And you can get that by going to rockyourretirement.com slash level of activity, all one word. And um, 
Thank you, Bart, for putting that together. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is a few years ago, my husband and I went to the Galapagos and we were so glad that we did because you cannot do that if you're in a wheelchair or a walker or using a cane. That is very rugged. I mean, you're getting in and out of rubber boats. You're mm-hmm. you're actually stepping into the water. So some of these things that people want to do, they really need to think about, okay, at what stage of my level activity do I need to be in in order to do these things and make sure you get them done? <laughs> when I'm you glad can. to hear you say that about Galapagos. We've also been there. And I'm actually writing an article right now about expedition travel Ooh. that it is not just for the able-bodied. Now, that's not to say that in a wheelchair you can go to Antarctica. Well, you can, but it's not going to have the same kind of experience. And by the way, we just recently did come back from Antarctica. Hmm. But um, and we've been to the we've, we're, we're avid travelers and have been around the globe. The Galapagos actually is one of the places that you can be you can go to and not be able-bodied. Now, a wheelchair is difficult, but if you are of limited mobility, you can still get into the Zodiacs and you can still get into the water and, and snorkel. And that's sort of the point that I want to make in this article that, you know, it's not limited to those who are fit. When I, I have a bad back and I've had several surgeries, I have somewhat limited mobility and I'm, I'm still a diver, but it's hard for me. But these expedition travels it, just because you have that limited mobility doesn't mean you have to not do an expedition. And by expedition, I mean going to the Galapagos or going to Fiji and going diving. What I did, they would get, I'd get into the Zodiac, they would put the equipment on my back, and then I'd roll over into the water. That's easy to do. Getting out of the boat, they'd take my equipment off while I was still in the water, and I would climb up the ladder. That's awesome. I, and, and now, so you can do it when you're when you have limited mobility, and that's what I want to encourage people to do expedition travel now before you don't want to. Right, and when you're done with that article, send me a link to it, and I'll put Absolutely. that link in the show notes so everybody can can read that. And I I want to read it myself. So yeah, thank you so much for that. Now, how can my listeners buy your book? It's available on Amazon, and it's also available on my website. BartAster.com uh, or through Amazon. Uh, it's been there to sit for a couple of years, and I look forward to um, getting lots more people. Who, and I really encourage people to send me comments about what they think, what has been helpful, what is not helpful. That's important. As a writer wants to get feedback, not just oh, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, we all want to do that, but uh, we want to do get we want to get feedback about what did we contribute to the world of literature. That is great, you know, and I'm looking for feedback too. So thank you for bringing that up. So if you are listening to this show and you appreciate it, if you would go to either the iTunes app, actually, I think you have to do this on the computer, but if you would rate and review this show, it helps get the word out and it helps people find the show. Because as you know, if you're listening, my listeners are older And many of us listen on our computers and not our iPhone apps. Doing that rating and review on either iTunes or Stitcher really helps the show. So we would appreciate it if you would do that. Um, Bart, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. You have been just a delight to listen to. I have really enjoyed being here and I appreciate it. Thank you again. And to my listeners, we'll see you next time on Rock Your Retirement. Thanks for listening to the Rock Your Retirement Show. If you are rocking your retirement or know someone who would make a great guest on our show, please send us an email at podcast at rockyourretirement.com. 